Today we're going to talk about the skeleton. We'll start with the axial skeleton, which forms the axis of the body. So the top whoop, of the skeleton is the skull. As you can see, the skull is a fairly large bone, although actually it is made up of quite a few smaller bones. So most of the skull here is made up of the frontal bone, the two parietal bones, the occipital bone, and the two temporal bones, one on each side. And these are fused together with fibrous joints so that they don't move. So that is your skull. It attaches to a whole bunch of other smaller bones that again are fused and make up the face. And then it's further attached to the mandible, which is the jaw bone. As we move down from the skull, we get to the middle portion of our body where you have the sternum, which will attach outward to the ribs. Now the attachment between the sternum and the ribs is by cartilage because you want your ribs to move but just a little bit. So that's a cartilaginous joint. And as you go further down, you get the pelvic bones. Put these together the right way. So this would be the pelvis. This is where the femur attaches and this is where the pelvis sits. Thump. So the other portion of your axial skeleton that's important is the vertebrae. And the vertebrae are a series of interlinking bones that move all the way down your back. There's quite a few of them. There are, in fact, three sections of it that are all together. The top part is the cervical, the middle part is the thoracic, and the bottom part is the lumbar. So the cervical would be small pieces like this. And there are seven of those. The thoracic is the middle section, which is middle-sized pieces like this. There are 12 of those. The lumbar has the much larger pieces. There are five of those. And if you didn't catch those numbers, seven, 12, five is also about the times you might eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner if you're trying to remember. And then finally, at the very bottom of the vertebrae, there is the um, sacrum and coccyx, which are all fused together. And that is most of the axial skeleton. Now we'll move on to the appendicular skeleton. So starting with the appendicular skeleton, we'll start with the arm-based appendages. Your arms each have a number of bones. The humerus is the bone that sits from your shoulder and comes down to the elbow. And then there are two bones in the lower section. You have the radius and the ulna, and they fit together to sit in your arm between the humerus and your hand. Your hand also has a number of different bones. So this is the skeleton inside of your hand. These small ones at the bottom are the meta, are the carpal bones, they're very small. These middle ones are the metacarpals, that's where your palm goes. And all these external ones are the digits or phalanges of which you've got three in each of these four fingers and two in the thumb. Your humerus also attaches to your shoulder blade or scapula that sits in your back. Now we'll talk about the legs. Your legs are built very similarly to your arms. Coming out of your hip is the femur, which is the longest bone in the body, and it goes from the bottom of the hip down to the knee. Then below the knee, you have two bones, the tibia, which is the shin bone, and the fibula, which kind of fits right next to it. Unlike the arm between the femur and the tibia and fibula, there is one more bone on the knee, which is the patella or the knee cap. In the foot, you'll find another similar setup to the hands. There are larger bones in the foot as they hold together at your ankle. They're called the tarsals. The metatarsals are where most of your sort of base of your foot would be, or the mid part of your foot. And then you again have digits or phalanges at the top, three in each except the toe, which has two. So if you're trying to figure out a bone 
and you're trying to figure out where it goes, you want to first of all think about what it looks like and where it might fit. So if I grabbed this bone, you'd say, well, that's a long bone. Long bones are typically found in the appendicular skeleton, so it's got to be one of the appendages. So is it a long bone that would fit in the arm? Hmm. It seems a little bit long for my humerus or my other part. Is it a long bone that would fit in the leg? Well, it seems a little bit short for my femur, but it does seem to have that shin bone feel to it, and in fact, it is the tibia. There are a few bones that are different depending on exactly where on the male-female sex spectrum people fall. And obviously, these are not perfectly contained in little boxes, and they vary, but there are a couple spots that are pretty significant. The pelvic bones typically are the most obvious place where we think about there being a difference between male and female. Well, why is that? Mostly it is because between the pelvic bones is where the baby's head ends up going. So it has to go through this space in the bones. So therefore this space needs to be the right size. In males, the space is smaller and in females, the space is wider. And you can typically tell this bum, this angle, this angle will get a little bit wider in women. So this is more likely to be a male skeleton angle. There are two more interesting places that you find differences in male and female skeletons. One of them is here in the mandible or the jaw. You can see this has an angle to it. In many men, the angle is more of a right angle and in women, you'd expect it to be obtuse or longer, so it extends down and the jaw comes out further. So again, this is likely to be a male skeleton. And then there's actually a funky spot at the back of the skull that creates a notch in men and is not there in women. You should go looking for that, it's pretty fun. To mention a few of the different joints that you find in the skeleton, including the ones in the skull, which are fibrous so they don't move, the ones between the ribs, which are cartilaginous because they move, but not very much. What about all these other moving joints? So there's a bunch of different kinds. There are joints that can only move in one direction. So for example, my elbow moves in and it moves out. It really can't on its own shift up and down without moving the rest of my arm. So it moves one way, we call it a hinge, like a door. In some cases, we have joints that move in a couple different directions. So I can tip my head around, I can move forward and back a little bit, and I can make an almost circle, but it's not perfect. That joint's a pivot. It's only the one at the very top of the vertebrae. The rest of the vertebrae have cartilage between them because you don't want your back to actually make a right angle bend. Ball and socket joints allow even more movement. So my shoulder can go up and all the way around, and that's a ball and socket. And you can even see this in the bones. The other bone that's a ball and socket is your hip. You can see the ball on the femur, and it fits into the socket on the pelvis and can therefore spin around if you are flexible enough. Your wrist seems like it can spin around a lot, but it's a different type of joint because the bones at the bottom are flat and they sit against a flat portion of the radius in the ulna. So we call that gliding because they glide around each other, but they still, still allow a fairly large range of motion. There are also saddle joints in which you actually see a saddle-like look between the joint and the bone. Your ankle shows saddle features. And in fact, if you can see this bone and the way it fits on top of that, it actually looks a little bit like a saddle on a horse. We describe movement in specific ways based on how the body moves relative to typically sort of the midpoint of your body. So if I draw a line down the middle of my body, I can think about it that way, whether things are towards me or away from me in some manner. So first we have flexion and extension. And in that case, we're looking at two different bones and looking at the angle. Do they make a tight angle or do they make a far angle? So for instance, my elbow is flexed when it's in like this and extended like that. You might also be familiar with this from feet. We flex our foot upward or point our toe and that's an extension. Abduction and adduction 
is the movement of multiple things towards the middle or away. Adduction is when you add things together to the middle. So here my arms are adducting. And abduction is when I pull them away. For example, if I was opening a curtain. And then the final movements are pronation and supination. Supination. Pronation is inward movement. Supination is outward movement. And we don't think about this a lot unless we're trying to move a body, but it interestingly enough comes up a lot in the feet if you're a runner. So you can't see my feet, but you can see the skeleton foot and his toe is right here. So if this was my foot and this was my toe and I pronated, it would mean that I moved inward, which would mean that I'd put pressure on the inside of my foot and on this toe, which is exactly what happens in people who overpronate. You put pressure on this toe, you can also form bunions by causing this part of the skeleton to increase. So overpronating is your feet turning inward. Supinating would be your feet turning outward. Those are all the movements of the skeletal system.